Hey guys, number one Marmaduke fan here. We are almost done with Anonymous Noise. I think there are two volumes left. Ryoko Fukuyama's writing little uh, notes in the columns about how she's winding down the series and wrapping up the anime, and she's kind of, you know, like s sad that the story is ending, but happy that uh, she's been able to bring it to all of her wonderful fans. It's been a neat ride. So we've got a few more volumes left. Uh, the, the plot threads seem to be coming towards their conclusions, but uh, there's some neat stuff to talk about in this one. So I'll just uh, hop through it. So the TLDR is this is a very complicated, sordid uh, love triangle combined with Japanese uh, rock and roll. I really dig it. It's kind of cheesy and on the nose with some of the romantic uh, tropes, but I'm really impressed by the quality of the series overall. Some awkward artistic moments, but really dynamic rock sequences and fantastic humor throughout. So I recommend it. Uh, so diving into this issue, Oh, come on, Cuddles. Can I do one review without you meowing? So uh, the In No Hurry to Shout is performing at Rock Horizon. And this year they've been graduated to the biggest stage and they're actually performing in the rain. Uh, one subplot is that Yuzu has been wanting to sing for his mother at least once uh, b before he graduates. And last uh, last concert, he tried to do that uh, because Alice was having a meltdown on stage. So he was going to sing to try to like shake her out of it. And he tried to sing and he couldn't have anything. No, nothing would come out. His vocal cords are basically damaged. So at, th at this concert, he feels like uh, he might be able to do it. And then on stage, he freezes up for a second. Uh, usually it's Alice who has the meltdown and creates the panic. But on, this time it's Yuzu who's ha having some emotional trouble. And... Alice, when she's not creating trouble, is actually really good at helping her friends get out of trouble. So she kind of like just gives him a reassuring smile, covers it for him for a second, and then uh, they time a perfect uh, cor chord together. So there's this really neat tr uh, continuing thread where neat moments in the rock and roll concert also have like this secondary emotional significance where Alice is very supportive to Yuzu. And on stage, Yuzu has like a flashback to his deceased father about how his deceased father would give him like a little kiss, his, a kiss on the cheek as like a sign of affection. And then when he and Alice are being stupidly adorable together and drying off each other's hair, he admits that he wants to kiss her. She asks him not to, so he compromises by just giving her a little peck on the neck like, like his dad, dad used to do. Uh, you, Ryoko is very good at doing sort of stupidly adorable romantic scenes. That's one of her strengths. And she actually does it for both Momo and Yuzu to kind of give fodder to shippers on both sides of the Yuzu-Momo uh, love triangle debate. And then jumping forward a bit. So here's an example of her do doing the opposite. Uh, Momo is kind of uh, I think he just drops his glasses and breaks them, so he's completely blind. And then he ends up in this sort of this stupid, ironic situation where Alice has to guide him to the eye to the eyeglasses guy. And uh, what's kind of weird to him is he and Alice have always had a very weird relationship. She was pursuing him; he was running away from her. Uh, he didn't want her back in his life because he was kind of ashamed with himself. And then they got together. But then Alice was having emotional problems, so then he dumped Alice to kind of give her some space to work through her emotional problems. It was kind of like a selfless act of dumping her, and now they have kind of come full circle back to being normal friends again. And so it's almost like being normal is kind of weird for them, and he likes it. So Alice does something stupid where she gets the bright idea that she can put the glasses on his head and then sneak away without him seeing, but then she realizes that doesn't work, and so she takes the glasses off again so he can't see her. And he tells her, put the glasses on, put, put the glasses on me again, kind of in a command, in his commanding masculine uh, way. Hopping forward, uh, this big surprise is that after In No Hurry has had like their big concert, they've got their uh, first big single uh, as the opening for an anime. Everything's going great for them. Yuzu asks that the uh, band consider putting the band on hiatus to give him a chance to basically work out his troubled relationship with his mom. And none of them like the idea of putting the band on hiatus, but they're very supportive uh, of Yuzu, especially Alice, who is kind of like, they're they're like best friends, and if Alice wasn't stupid, she'd realize that Yuzu is is perfect for her. But anyway, uh, she they're supportive for Yuzu in this time, but they're kind of melancholy about the band 
uh, not breaking up, but going on hiatus. So Alice comes and talks to Yuzu at the beach, which is an important callback to their childhood. And Ryoko Fukuyama actually talks about how she got choked up writing this chapter because this is a callback to uh, when Alice and Yuzu uh, first met. Y Yuzu uh, wrote a song for Alice. Yuzu sang for Alice when she was basically at the lowest point point of her life. And that's the reason why he actually lo lost his voice is because he sang saying for Alice, but he did it for her because she basically was at like this desperately hopeless p point in her life. And now Alice gets a chance to help, to help him out. He entrusts her with the song he's uh, written. She's going to write the lyrics for him. So whereas the relationship has always been Yuzu writing songs for Alice, now Alice gets to write a song for Yuzu kind of as a way of repaying him. And then uh, to his surprise, she gives him a peck on the, on the neck, just like he, he gave her kind of like as a, promise that you'll come back to that you'll work this out and come back to us and she this she reveals that she knows that yuzu has actually recovered his voice he hasn't told anyone about this yet uh but he's a he, he he's regained his voice and he's able to, to sing again so it seems like uh that that subplot's going to come to fruition soon while yuzu's going to be away alice being gung-ho gets the bright idea that she wants to get their song Othello to be the number one song in Japan. So they're not going to tour and do concerts, but they're going to tour Japanese CD shops and do like signings and photos with, with fans as a way of basically keeping interest in the band active while they're on hiatus. Because if you're a, po a popular band and you go on hiatus, you, 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 you could potentially lose momentum. So Alice is basically going to take on keeping up momentum for the band while Yuzu is taking uh, his break. And Ryoko actually talks about getting to tour Japanese CD shops to get photos of uh, like bands visiting CD shops as a promotional thing. She does a lot of really neat research into, like she finds out about the subculture she's interested in, J-pop, you know, rock enthusiasts. And she brings like real locations and things into the work, work to add a splash of realism to it. Uh, chapter 92, I really, really like because it just looks at a secondary character who's kind of been in the background the whole time, but I've never even talked about him because he hasn't made much of an impression. This chapter focuses on their manager, Yana, who's kind of a little neurotic. He, you know, is the adult who has to like manage everything and set up all their shows and gives them a talking to when they do something stupid and have a meltdown on stage. And we just find out some interesting stuff about him. He, he used to be in a band and it failed. Uh, and then... Uh, w he discovers in no hurry and he has to be an advocate for them. So it's kind of a neat thing where like the fail, a lot of failed artists become critics, but uh, critics can have, it it's exactly like the movie Ratatouille. I love the mo movie Ratatouille because it basically argues that art critics aren't artists, but when an art critic discovers and defends a good artist, it's like the most beautiful thing an art critic can do. So Yana's a music manager and he discovers fresh young talent and he uh, gives them their opportunity and he, and he has to defend them. Uh, as He's kind of like reflecting on that as he, he – because for him it's sad that this great band he discovered is potentially going on hiatus. So it's the worst possible thing that could happen for him. So he's a little melancholy about it. But Yuzu gives him some support – a supportive thank you for hel helping us get our start – and then uh, Yana gets like a, just an adorable little romantic moment because that's what Ryoko Fukuyama is uh, good at. He talks to, uh, I think her name is Sukika, but she's like a female music manager who works with Momo. And he sort of accidentally says, marry me. When he just wants to say something nice to her, he says, marry me out loud. And she thinks about it for a second. And then he freaks out and try, tries to correct it. And then she says, yes, uh, because she's liked him for a while. And she says, I'm an excellent judge of... Uh, my hunches are never wrong. I think you're a good person and my hunches are never wrong. And then Yana thinks, well, that's quite a coincidence. My hunches are never wrong too. He had a hunch about In No Hurry to Shout. She has a hunch about him. That's fantastic. So the romantic, you know, adorable, dorky stuff is being paralleled with the music industry stuff. So it all blends together fantastically. What a great series. It's nearing its end. Uh, She's kind of, uh, I kind of like how even like thematically she's preparing you for, for the end. It's not quite over. There are some things that need to be wrapped up, but with, but the end is in sight and she's kind of preparing you, uh, for, for that end by giving you some satisfying, satisfying conclusions for some of the secondary characters. Real quick, I'm just going to flip through, uh, a Marvel and DC book. Uh, this is the $1 Flashpoint. 
I think it's like the start of Flashpoint Paradox. Before Flashpoint Paradox, there was Flashpoint, written by Geoff Johns and art by Andy Kubert, of course, the son of Joe Kubert, brother of Adam Kubert and the Kubert School. So the art is fan, uh, fantastic. Uh, the story was pretty good, too. Uh, and a lot of modern comics, I've kind of said my problem with modern comics is they're written with the assumption that you know who the Flash is and you really care about the Flash or you really care about Bruce Wayne. So one thing about this comic is this is the one that's famous for having Flash go to another dimension. And in the other dimension, he meets Batman, but Batman isn't Bruce Wayne. Batman is uh, Thomas Wayne, Bruce Wayne's father in this. Okay, that's pretty neat. That's neat to me because I know who Bruce Wayne and Thomas Wayne are, but that's a reveal that works if you know enough about Batman that you know that Thomas Wayne is Batman's father. Now, they did some nice stuff, like they had the family photo on the wall to kind of like help cue you to that. Uh, it, I think it's fine. It, that might be like Batman's a famous enough character that I think that you can assume people have a little bit of knowledge of Batman still like Basically, what I'm saying is I like it. It's still an example of a modern comic, assuming that the kid who reads the comic has some, some, some familiarity with not just Flash, but also Batman and the broader uh, DC world. The art, uh, really solid figures, dynamic uh, action poses. Uh, the panel thing, uh, Andy even does something neat with the panels. I generally don't like solid black panels because I feel like uh, they're overbearing and burdensome. And Andy's using the solid black panels, but he actually does some variety where he'll switch from black to white. And he'll usually do it to kind of indicate a moment in time or a change in tone. So uh, let me find a really good example. So here it's kind of like it's help, the white is helping to frame them in this big emotional scene. And then the black down here sort of visually separates this little inner exchange from the bigger moment up here. Later, I think he used it to indicate like them, walk, like, like he'll do it for a scene change, so them walking out white and then black to hone in and say this is all one conversation. So he's basically, it's sort of like how uh, Bill Watterson and Calvin Hobbes would use black panels to uh, connect a bunch of regular panels together visually. He's, he's smart enough to know that if he's going to use the black panels, he ought to use it to kind of say, these panels go together. This is, di this is a little different from that. It kind of helps guide you and it helps give you maybe like a break at certain points, uh, when you transition from one scene to the other. There's one another really good. Okay. Here's another really good example. Black for the fight, white for the close up on Batman, because that's a little, that's a, the, the, it basically tells you this is a little bit different. A fun, a fun comic. Uh, modern, uh, you know what? My criticism of modern comics, I don't care. This is a really good comic. I enjoyed it. Uh, this Thanos Gamora is a reprint of Warlock and the Infinity Watch number nine. And this is a tie-in issue to the famous uh, Infinity Gauntlet fight that inspired the movie. So A-plus to Marvel for putting out some of the comics that actually connect to the movie that everybody went to see. They even advertised the movie in it. So that's fantastic. And this is just a great uh, standalone comic. It talks about a really dark, uh, mature subject matter. So I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. So uh, Jim Starlin was the creator and writer. Uh, on, I don't know if it's Angel or on Hell Medina was the penciler and Robert Almond was the inker. The art is fabulous. Uh, this I, I, one of the things I like about cosmic Marvel is that when uh, they would do cosmic stories in Marvel, they will always do like these really mind bending, you know, like infinite universe creatures. I, I guess I kind of like Spider Man in the street side of Marvel a little bit more, but at least what they know to do in the space books is they know to like crank the space age weirdness to the max there's a, there's definitely some jack kirby inspiration in like the wildness of that uh and so the panel like the panel work I, I dig this because this is a solid black outline here pushing this forward in space and this huge wide shot has a thin line which creates the fact that it pushes it back in space which means that it makes the space feel like it's farther away from you and this is pressing in on you that's some great stuff there's even some like cool stuff where they have like a see-through galactus and planets you can kind of see through them without any like digital coloring effects they're communicating transparency just with simple line work wow wowzer 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 so uh, the story follows warlock gamora if if you know her from the movies and this kind of get, tells you like a sad backstory from earlier in her life galactus is using her as a puppet 
uh, in this sort of intergalactic space politics things that he's got to go through to save the universe from Thanos. And it kind of doesn't matter to Gamora if Galactus has a good reason to use her like a puppet. She be she despises the idea of being someone else's puppet because it robs her of her agency. And something in her past has made her like hate the idea of being controlled or under the tutelage of anyone. When she has her flashback, there's this great uh, convention where there's a thin red rounded outline around her flashback, visually separating this from this. And they even do a cool thing where they put a little abstract shape here to indicate the start of it. So it's a normal panel, red panel to indicate the start of the flashback. That's genius. Uh, when she was a kid, she was raised by Thanos to be like a badass Supergirl. And he would tell her, you know, don't go out on your own and she was a stupid kid and she went out on her own and of course what happens is she gets she got assaulted uh they don't they're not they're not explicit about what happened but it's implied that they're uh that that a guy with a knife uh tortured her and probably assaulted her uh in, in other ways I, I won't describe she basically says it what what was done to her was too graphic to describe so so i won't try to uh and kind of like I like how in this posing, it shows how Thanos, who's this evil megalomaniac, to her, looks like a hero, just in this great pose and the great light surrounding him and eliminating the outline of his fist. That's some fantastic uh, positive negative space stuff going on. And then uh, they know to have a big page splash when it's something important, like zooming out and showing like all of these thugs that Thanos absolutely murdered because of what they did to her. Like that's an important moment. You don't want to. You don't want to emphasize like the the dopey little moment. You want to emphasize something big. Uh, after like a lot of torturous surgery, uh, she's basically reconstructed as like a superhuman, and she has scars. And Thanos tells her, "Well, the the scars will heal completely over time. But although the physical scars will heal, the emotional scars never fu never fully heal." heal. Uh, back in the present, she finds the space god she's got to find. I love how they use negative white space to indicate infinity. And then a big two-page splash, again, for a really big moment, unlocking the super secret, whatever they got, are uh, eternity and infinity gods. You have to have like a big over-the-top dynamic sequence. That's fantastic stuff. Uh, and then she's thrown back and... Uh, basically just has to come to terms with that the pain of that experience never fully go goes away. She's grown up, she's moved beyond Thanos, she's become a hero, uh, she's become a much more capable and self-reliant person, but the the harm of that abuse, uh, she, she still carries that with her in some in some ways, which is, it's just sad. It's a sad little poignant uh, point about the character, and it's a completely self-contained st story about a character that also ties into this bigger, you know, universe fight that was going on in marvel comics at the time what it you, you can pick this up not know anything about the character get a complete feel for the character and the bigger universe that's going on and just say i want to go read more infinity war i haven't read the infinity war i gotta go read the infinity war now it's a, it's a thing i know about through uh fake geek guy nerd osmosis in the marvel movies but i've actually got to go sit down and read the whole infinity gauntlet fight don't i all right so uh Three really good comics today. 18 minutes, that's enough. I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. Catch you later.